There's debate over the direct threat of the inserted genes in GMO crops, as they may not be detectable in the human body. But the real danger may come from pesticides associated to genetically modified foods. Genetically engineered seed biotechnology typically has not been used to increase crop yield, and nutrition, drought tolerance, but instead for profitable pesticide-resistant products. 80% of the GMO crops are bioengineered only for pesticide resistance. Not surprising, given that the top five biotech companies are chemical companies that manufacture pesticides. This allows farmers to spray herbicides directly onto the crops, uh, raising a theoretical possibility that the level of residues of the herbicide on food we buy at the supermarket may have increased. Or at least it was theoretical until now. Monsanto's Roundup Ready soybeans are the number one GM crop genetically engineered to be resistant to the herbicide Roundup, also sold by Monsanto, allowing farmers to spray fields with the Roundup herbicide glyphosate, which then kills the weeds while leaving the soy standing. Monsanto maintains that Roundup Ready soybeans are compositionally equivalent to that of conventional soy, a concept that is used to argue that GMO foods are therefore safe as non-GMO. But Monsanto didn't report the level of pesticide residues. In fact, some of the comparison tests were done on Roundup Ready soybeans that hadn't been sprayed at all, which is the whole point of having Roundup Ready plants, so you can spray them with Roundup. In contrast to real-life samples from the market, transgenic crops intended for scientific studies are often produced without the application of herbicides, or at doses lower than typically used by farmers. It wasn't until this study was published in 2014 when the full composition of ready-to-market soybeans was analyzed. Here's how much glyphosate was found in the GMO beans, along with a glyphosate breakdown product called AMPA. Here's how much was found in organic soy. None. What about conventional non-GMO soy, where glyphosate is sprayed on the soil to kill weeds between crop cycles? None. So GMO soybeans are really not equivalent. They appear to have substantially more pesticide residues. The debate then shifts from the safety of Roundup Ready soybeans to the safety of Roundup itself. GMO soy has been found to be contaminated with pesticide residues, but are these levels anything to worry about? The researchers describe these levels as high, but compared to what? Compared to the maximum allowable residue levels. The legal limit for glyphosate in foods has been set at 0.1 to 0.2 mg per kilogram. So, okay, maybe these levels are high, exceeding the legal limits by an average of about 2,000%, whereas organic and conventional non-GMO soy both had none. So what did Monsanto do? Did the industry ditch the whole GMO thing, uh, go back to using less pesticides so residue levels wouldn't be so high, or they could just change the definition of high. What if they could get authorities to raise the maximum residue level from 0.1 or 0.2 up to, say, 20? Then the residue levels don't look so high anymore. Problem solved. The acceptance level of glyphosate in food and feed had been increased by authorities in countries that use Roundup Ready GMO crops. In Brazil they went up to 10, and U.S. and Europe now accept up to 20. In all these cases, the maximum residue level values appear to have been adjusted not based on any new evidence indicating glyphosate toxicity was less than previously understood, but pragmatically in response to actual observed increases in the content of residues in GMO soybeans. Otherwise, it wouldn't be legal to sell the stuff. What evidence do we have, though, that these kinds of residues are harmful? For 12 years, we've heard that Roundup interferes with embryonic development, but the study was about sea urchin embryos. For 14 years, that Roundup may disrupt hormones, but that's in mouse testicles. Blogs will dish about concerning new studies implicating Roundup in male fertility, but if you look at the study, it's about rat testicles. Some blogs cite studies with disturbing titles like Pre-Puberty Exposure Alters Testosterone Levels in Testicular Shape but they're talking about puberty in rats, though doesn't make as catchy a blog title. Why not use human tissue? Women are having babies every day. Why not just experiment on human placentas, which would otherwise just get thrown away? And in 2005, researchers did just that.
And despite all the negative effects in rodents, glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup, didn't seem to have much of a toxic effect on hu human cells, even at high doses, or have much effect on hormone-regulating enzymes. Leading Monsanto-funded reviewers to conclude that regardless of what hazards might be alleged based on animal studies, glyphosate is not anticipated to produce adverse developmental or reproductive effects in humans. But pure glyphosate isn't sprayed on crops. Roundup is, which contains a variety of adjuvants and uh, surfactants meant to help the glyphosate penetrate into tissues. And indeed, when the study was repeated with what's actually sprayed on GMO crops, there were toxic and or hormonal effects even at doses smaller than the 1 or 2% concentration that's used out in the fields. Similar results were found for other major pesticides. It took until 2014, but 8 out of 9 pesticide formulations tested were up to 1,000 times more toxic than their so-called active ingredients. So when you just test the isolated chemicals, you may not get the whole story. Roundup was found to be 100 times more toxic than glyphosate itself. Moreover, Roundup turned out to be among the most toxic pesticides they tested. It's commonly believed that Roundup is among the safest, though, an idea spread by Monsanto, the manufacturer. However, this inconsistency between scientific fact and industry claim may be attributed to the huge economic interests involved. Monsanto Company, the manufacturer of Roundup, spent years erroneously advising farmers to exclusively use ever greater quantities of Roundup to control the weeds in their fields. And for years, farmers listened. Meanwhile, these weeds were receiving evolutionary pressure to select for a trait of resistance to Roundup. The Roundup-resistant trait is now dominant in weeds growing in many areas of the country. The introduction of genetically engineered plants is regulated by the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service of the USDA, pursuant to its authority under the Plant Protection Act. Where, uh, where was the USDA while a weed problem that imperils modern agriculture practices was developing? In courtrooms across the country, USDA has been rebuked for having unreasonably and arbitrarily dismissed the environmental consequences of deregulating genetically engineered crops. In some cases, federal judges have found that the USDA could produce no written record that it had ever considered the impact on farmers. Thus, a federal district court invalidated USDA's decision to deregulate Roundup Ready alfalfa. USDA is now awaiting further directions from a federal judge before taking further steps to consider whether and on what terms to deregulate this crop. Since taking office, Secretary Vilsack has promised that the new administration would take a fresh look at biotech crop policy. But the biotech industry isn't waiting for new policy. Chemical industry giants such as Dow, BASF, and uh, Sagenta are plowing forward with new varieties of soy, corn, and cotton. They're already asking USDA to deregulate seed varieties that have been genetically engineered to tolerate their own herbicides. In fact, the evolution of Roundup-resistant weeds, while well, a problem for Monsanto, has been an opportunity for other large chemical companies. The immediate consequences of the deregulation and planting of these multiple herbicide-tolerant crops will be the increase in use of more toxic herbicides. Dicamba and 2,4-D are more toxic than Roundup, and their increased use can only be regarded as a setback for sustainable agriculture. In the longer term, the herbicide resistance of the weeds themselves could further change. If Roundup-resistant weeds evolved in only 10 years, uh, could, could, um, could multiple herbicide-resistant uh, weeds be far away? I'm going to ask that question again. If Roundup-resistant weeds evolved in only 10 years, could multiple herbicide-resistant weeds be far away? Indeed, several species of weeds already exhibit multiple herbicide resistance. The development of, multi, of, multi, of more multi-herbicide resistant weeds poses a very serious threat to agriculture in the United States as we know it. 
the increased expense for mechanical and hand labor to remove herbicide resistant crops on today's colossal farms could be cost prohibitive, potentially wreaking havoc on modern farming. Until now, the USDA has deregulated without condition every herbicide resistant seed variety that industry has produced. Will that pattern continue in the future? Does the USDA have the legal authority to attach conditions and restrictions or even to block the commercialization of genetically engineered herbicide resistant crops? Will that agency use that authority? Farmers have a long term investment in their chief asset, their land. Chemical companies operate on a shorter horizon. Nature's reaction to farm practices since the introduction and marketing of genetically engineered herbicide resistant crops has created a temporary opportunity for chemical companies, an opportunity they will pursue at the long term expense of the nation's farmers.